discussion. I'll bring up the first speaker who's part of our panel. We're speaking about solutions to load shedding. I've got a specialist in ESD. I've got a young, powerful entrepreneur as well. And uh, this session will be facilitated by Bulilani Balabala. Just briefly, let me read the bio of the first speaker. Please, can we settle down? Thank you so much. We've got the panel discussion. We're announcing the pitch winner. We're having lunch, and then it's a wrap. Just for the next hour, hour and a half, please, can we just settle down and give ear to our specialists? The first panelist is a powerful, powerful speaker, founder of a company called CoLab for Growth. She's been an entrepreneur in the SMME space strategist for the last 16 years in the development sector. She has dedicated her life and her career to facilitating and advancing the economic inclusion, participation and prosperity of African people. Not again, no. She's the founder of uh, CoLab for Growth, a personal mastery and venture building consulting for SMMEs. If you want to talk African people, you want to talk purpose, you speak to her. ESD specialist. Ladies and gentlemen, please can we put our hands together for Troliswa Moroka. Come on, Alex. Let's give a massive round of applause and show some love. Welcome. Let's have a seat. All right. The next uh, panelist is a speaker. Botale, the home of Josie's finest court. Is this where, is this the Kota place yes. that trended? We are looking forward to finding out about this one. He's in the building, okay. So they've been operating at the premise that is now known as Bailey's for more than 30 years. The Bailey family has participated in many businesses within Alexander. And Bailey's, which is the latest installment of the family business, was established in the year 2019 by the youngest generation of the family. On the premise, you'll find eatery, hair and beauty salon, games room, car wash, and more. A young, powerful entrepreneur. He's with us in the building. Ladies and gentlemen, please let's put our hands together for Botale. Come on, Alex. Let's show love. Let's show love. Have a seat, my brother. All right, and then next up, he doesn't need an introduction. He actually doesn't like being introduced, so I'm just going to call him as he is. He's the founder of uh, Hashtag Join Us for Tea. He's a visionary. They know him as Mr. Get Things Done. Please, can we put our hands together for Bulilani Balabala. Just, we're just consulting quickly. Just two minutes, please. All right. Um, there's one more. Apologies. So, I hear, and I stand to be corrected, that the way NetBank are so committed to entrepreneurs and what's happening and how they can assist them, they went and hired a specialist just to deal with the load shedding and entrepreneurs. Like are you not the minister of uh, that they wanted to? Oh, okay, he's not. All right, but so he's a specialist at uh, helping entrepreneurs with what we're going through now and load shedding and how we can navigate. Ladies and gentlemen, please let's put our hands together for Quinton Grayley from NetBank. Thank you so much and welcome. Panelist, over to you. Um, is this cool? No feedback. Is it cool? Sure. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you so much for coming out today. Um, and I think just thank you to the amazing NetBank team for championing this particular session and the topic that gave me heart palpitations. 
solutions, solutions. But um, having an amazing partner means we get to have these um, thoughtful conversations, but not just conversations, one where if you are able to fully immerse yourself um, in the discussions that we have, you'd be able to reconfigure your business. You know, One of the most beautiful things, and I think we sort of touched on it when we were sitting and chatting amongst ourselves is, you know, there's quite a number of townships we've already gone to, I think over 11. Now the interesting factor is that one of the most, one of the things that stands out, I mean, you go to a venue as prominent as Max's Lifestyle and they say, we never, we know we've built a 300 seater conference space, but we never even knew that the space could do this. And we've got backup power. You guys have given us an amazing idea. You know, you go to these amazing restaurants, uh, Shisanyamas in the township, and the guys are saying, you know, we've sat, we're sitting with a venue that only operates in the afternoon when people come back from work. During the day, it's a sitting duck. And all of these are these amazing entrepreneurs who don't have anywhere to work from. You guys have helped us to rethink how we actually do business and opening up our space to these amazing individuals to come in and work from there in the morning. So that's a game changer. It's almost the indirect effect of having a deliberate partner who's interested in saying we go to any township, doesn't matter the floor, the tile, the ceiling, the area, the roof, but we go in with the deliberate, and those are the ripple effects of being deliberate. And I think as my opener, it's also the, almost the ripple effects of being an entrepreneur yourself, because you came here by virtue of either wanting to develop yourself, you came here either by virtue of you saw the topic, you came here by virtue of being invited, or just saying there are other entrepreneurs, and that in and itself is a success factor in my perspective and view. So today I've got amazing panelists um, with me and uh, Fezila couldn't join us, unfortunately got caught up in Glackstop. Um, was really gonna be unpacking the green energy side and how you can utilize that in your business. But I've got phenomenal guests that are here. I mean, I've got Koliswa, um, who's a local from Alexander, a phenomenal, phenomenal individual, who's an entrepreneur but works with entrepreneurs, right? Um, I'm going to give them each um, an opportunity to introduce themselves, but I want you to get an idea of the composition and mix. And then you've got Bushale, who's a phenomenal entrepreneur, who's really just a game changed the Kota space. So when the 580,000 Rand Kota was trending, it's his God. <laughs> and, and we've got Quentin, right? And I think for me, Quentin brings in a, a beautiful blend, right, in terms of some of the solutions that NetBank and themselves are solving for that you could potentially pick up on. And that's our mix for the day. So as we chat, I encourage you with the notebooks that you got walking in, ask, make notes, ask whatever questions. Because this session is about an hour, 10 minutes. Immediately after that, we will then lead to the pitching and the food. Um, then we can continue networking. But ask whatever questions that you need to ask. So let's come up with our own solutions. So I'll kick off with the, the amazing Koliswa. Just tell us a bit. You know, let's pretend we don't know you. I don't know that you're from Alex. You're not born and bred here. Who's Koliswa? Um, what got you into entrepreneurship and the business you ran? Okay, my name is Ukoli Somaraka, and um, I'm an entrepreneur, but I'm also a mom of two girls that are homeschool. And I guess part of the reason I decided to be an entrepreneur is I wanted the flexibility, right, to teach my kids and also to run a business. So to have a thriving career, but also to be there for my kids. Um, and that's one of the reasons I chose to, to be an entrepreneur. But really, Nichera um, and really my, my design, my passion is around finding solutions to our problems. And the reason I went into the development sector in particular was that as in Tomazana, as Alexandra, I've always had people come in Alexandra and think they have solutions for us, right? Um, You'd have corporates coming in, donating food, donating that, and then taking pictures with us and then putting us on their uh, financial reports. And we've done, we've made a difference, you know? So I was actually, unfortunately, in one of the publications. I was like, but what did these guys do? I don't remember because they came in for a one day workshop and they, they took pictures of us. They made a difference, you know? So for me, it was always saying I wanted to sit at the table and, and I wanted to create those tables, and that's why I became an entrepreneur. So I started Colorful Growth really uh, five years ago, but I've been in the space for like 16 years, uh, in the development sector for 16 years. Colorful Growth especially focuses on African entrepreneurs, black entrepreneurs in particular, um, and the, the whole objective is to say, 
entrepreneurship is a new game for us as black businesses. We are always used as being employees. We don't know how to be entrepreneurs, most of us. We are first generation entrepreneurs. What does it look like? And because we've been in Alex, the exposure to business has always been survivalist business. It's always been, it has a shop, or, you know, a business that puts food on the table. But how does a business that wants to grow bigger than that do it in this game? You have to understand the entrepreneurship and the business language. I think that's what we do. So what we do is we bring programs, we bring consulting, and we bring community together to build those ventures that can scale up and can contribute productively and effectively to the communities that they operate in, but also to the larger economy. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, it's a great honor to be in front of everyone. Uh, my name is Butale Bailey, um, and I'm the founder of Bailey's. Uh, like Bulelani explained, um, we not got the business. Unfortunately, we haven't hit that 580 million rand mark, but I hope we'll get there very soon. Um, but yeah, so Bailey's is a fast casual eatery that's based Momo Alexi. Um, yeah, and it's been a very um, colorful journey, you know. Um, even my journey leading into the business. So I'm a BCom Law and LLB graduate. Um, social impact has always been something that I've wanted to do. You know, growing up more LX, you just see the injustices that happen every single day. Um, so for me, I pursued that route as a way to try and address those issues. Um, but coming to like third, fourth year of my LLB, I then saw that perhaps this is not the vehicle to administer that change and the one to really drive you know, what we want to see coming out of our communities. Um, and then the opportunities of Bailey's just fell on my lap, unfortunately, because um, it came about in a very sad way. Um, my aunt who was running the precinct that we based at had passed away. Um, and my grandfather essentially called me into a room and he said, we've got this piece of land, just do anything with it, you know. He even told me if Tandar Rekiseris Kopas, do that. You know, it was that informal. Um, and then we went through an entire journey of, you know, what would add value in our community? What would really make people feel proud to call themselves Motu Otwanko Alexandra? Um, and then that's how the Kota came about. Um, the Kota has traveled all over now, you know. We've got guys coming from all over the world who've seen it from European countries, their friends posting about it and talking about it and saying there's this particular place you have to try. Um, so that's really exciting for us. We've been voted Gauteng's second best Kota brand for two years in a row now um, on different platforms. Yeah. So for us to be able to carry you know, the flag of Alex is something that makes me really, really proud. Um, yeah, and that's my short little introduction. So if you look at me and you question the weight gain, look no further. <laughs> So, but now, Quentin, may, maybe just tell us also just a bit about, just a bit about who you are, your position, and the role that you occupy at NetBank with, you know, the, the load shedding and all the solutions. Yeah, 100%. Thank you very much. Um, and guys, thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Um, so, I'm just going to give a little bit of a blurb about myself. I'm unfortunately not as well spoken as my colleague sitting to my right here. Um, I actually mentioned it to Lizzie a little bit earlier. I'm actually a closet introvert. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm at NetBank. I've been, been very blessed and grateful to be at NetBank for the last 20 years in predominantly a solution innovation position. Now, it's varied over the over the numerous years, obviously. But, you know, at the core, my responsibility has always been delivering solutions that actually meet the needs of clients. Also, very importantly, um, you know, and that's the solution that I'll be talking about a little bit later, um, you know, any solution that I look at, I look at it from the point of view as a client, as a consumer, because I'm a consumer, right? And I think specifically the product we'll be talking about a little bit um, later on is a solution that didn't exist that couldn't meet my need in the banking sector. Um, yeah, so, so that's basically it. Um, yeah. Let's give him a round of applause. Now, call you some, maybe if you can just grab the mic. Just so you sort of, oh, yeah, I, th I think they switched that one off, but we'll see. But you sort of spoke a little bit about what inspired you to get into the type of space that you're in. 
But oftentimes, you know, as entrepreneurs, we really struggle to move to the next level, right? And primarily because of, okay, there's certain blockages sometimes that come that keep us from being innovative. Now, I want to ask a sort of two-pronged uh, question, right? How important is it to be innovative and forward-thinking in your business? And then number one, is there a way that one, is there a formula even for that which one could utilize to draw innovative ideas? Because ideally, my perspective is this, and my perception is this really of the matter is, it's adapt or die, right? We saw it with um, the lockdown, uh, we saw it with COVID-19, and we've seen it with multiple situations that might not necessarily this, that are socioeconomic um, impact and, and situations, and now we've got this load shedding, and I could choose to sit back and complain, or I could find solutions. It's easier spoken than done, but that's why we're having this particular conversation to start to jock that mindset. So I think for me, the first thing we have to do is understand what innovation is. Because a lot of people, when they think innovation, they think technology, right? So they immediately say, my, my business, I, ha I have to create an app, you know? And that's innovation. But innovation is saying, how do I do the everyday things differently? And if you see the big businesses that are innovative, they are doing the, the everyday things differently. But Khaled, the person that we're sitting with right now, we've been selling God does more legs forever. But he's done something different with his quota and his target market, as an example, changes the game a bit, right? He's not, I'm sure he branded the quota high. I'm sure like, you know, so it's small things that you do just to change things up. So you always have to ask yourself, what business am I in? And when you understand what business am I in, you then say, who's doing what I want to do? And how do I do it differently? And that's where innovation comes in. But also, we are prone to go with the most popular thing, right? So if somebody is selling juice on the other side and it's making, I mean, quite like, there was this ice cream girl, the other, like, a few years ago, load shedding, not load shedding, COVID, COVID, post COVID, Nyana, big thing, la ice cream, la ma shwam shwam, la wa, a shwab siwe. Nya kumbon? Everyone went and started an ice cream business because they saw one person succeeding. But we don't understand the value chain behind that. So if somebody is selling the shwam shwam ice cream, how can I be the delivery person while I'm ice cream? Because we used to stand in lines. How can I start? the manufacturing yeah, the ice cream layer so that they buy from me? How can I start a sweet business so that she buys from me, I provide the sweets, they don't have to go and pick and pay? So you start thinking about the everyday things and mostly you start thinking about the things that you enjoy. It's so fulfilling to do a business in an area that you enjoy. If you're just doing it for the money, your energy and your fuel is going to run out definitely. Now, Butlale, man, you know, I want to ask this question in this format. Uh, I mean, I've always looked at, I mean, she sort of touched on it, Ikota. Traditionally, you know, we've seen a lot of places, Emma Lokshin, but in some of Now, uh, now you're a smart guy who could have been in some law firm somewhere or having started your own law firm, but you decided, let me go into the Gota space, right? But to quantify that further, I see so many massive opportunities in the township, but we sort of leave them because one has that Aban Bazotin when I start selling veggies on the side of the road, you know? When I start opening my own mechanic shop at the corner of the main corner, what are my friends gonna say is they drive up and down looking clean, going to their offices. And in my view, they end up leaving money on the table in those communities, right? So what, what really inspired you to go into this space, um, number one? And what sort of innovative techniques have you utilized I mean, to draw some of these customers that you've been getting, right, from all over the globe and more and more are going to keep coming. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, the lesson of selling Estratin is, is something I've actually learned from you. Um, we spoke the one time and you, you aptly put it by saying that, you know, if things don't work out, when you'll be okay because you'll be able to buy a 1400 and be able to paint because of the lessons you've learned, you know. So I think definitely that we all need to have that sort of attitude when it comes to entrepreneurship, you know, to be able to build from the bottom up. Um, yeah, so 
That's the one question. Um, but I think for us as Baileys, what we've done very differently was so value innovation. Osi Koleswa spoke about innovation. And one principle is called value innovation. Looking at what the customer values before they uh, purchase your product, as well as after that, you know. Um, so for us at Baileys, we really worked on those. Because at the end of the day, a food product is a food product. You may have grown up in a household where they use garlic instead of onion. And that ultimately um, changes your preference for food. So we could essentially never be the best gotta in the world to everyone, you know. But we put in so many measures beforehand. From the minute you walk into the store, our staff will greet you with a smile. And those are things that they've seen naturally done by us, you know. It's not we force them. When a customer walks in, you must treat them like this and this. They've seen that you greet a customer like this, you handle them this way. And even after sales, you know, if someone's got a concern, how do you deal with it? So I think, yeah, that for, for us, that has been the big thing, as well as social media. We've really worked on our branding. Um, yeah, we've invested in that, you know. Our social media pages, as well as our, intern, our website, all have a particular look and feel. Um, we've, we, we've come to understand that we are not selling a gotha, but we're selling an entire experience. And you have to cater for that entire experience. So, yeah. Uh, I thought round of applause, Nyana. Excuse me? Yes, Mara, round of applause while texting. <laughs> Before I come to you, Quentin, I just want to throw this question. It's, it's no longer, I, I don't think, it's not, it's not even a question of how has anyone, or rather, has anyone been affected by load shedding? You know, it's a question of how have you been affected um, by load shedding? And it becomes a necessary conversation to have because, you know, sometimes when you've experienced uh, tumultuous difficulties in your business, am I difficult thinking is knee, you know, you end up not even thinking or even wanting to give up. But I think for me, you know, much to everyone who's in the room, um, closing down a business is not the end of the journey. You know, it's just recalibrating. And we need to get that out of the way because sometimes we... We look at the, you know, the closing down of a business or the failure of a business as a personal individual's failure. But it's not the personal individual's failure, which is why it's sort of important to always be in communities and groupings that are like-minded in thinking because you'll actually realize that in those spaces that even though the majority you know, have been negatively affected by load shedding, there's at, least, there's at least four or five individuals that are doing well. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna do well, but that story in and itself needs to then trigger how you navigate and how you think about um, your own personal business journey. So, Kolisa, how has load shedding affected you? And I mean, you work with a number of small businesses as well. And have you seen any of them sort of trying to navigate this time as opposed to taking the stance that says, well, I don't have electricity, I don't have a solution, I can't afford gas, I can't afford a backup uh, power, solar panels and inverters, I'm just gonna set this one out. So I think um, it has affected everyone. I'm in the service business and it has affected me. So how, personally, how we've dealt with it is I move my times around. So I work as per the load shedding schedule, right? So I'm more productive when there's power. So I've navigated that time, but it's not for everyone. That solution is for me, right? It's not for everyone. There are people that are highly dependent. I mean, I, I work with a lady, Ellen Popo, who's running a chicken farm and she, a thousand chicken died because of load shedding. That's a real issue, right? she's not able to survive and sustain his, her business because of that. So one has to start thinking, okay, what's the solution in this case? You know, so it's, it's all those things. We work with, with a lot of farmers, with a lot of businesses that are highly dependent on electricity. So it's, it's, it's saying, how do I move around this space? And some of them had, had to be, I need to adjust my times, right? Some of them have been the, the crowd support, Right, the crowd support Guti Mthambe, we can come together as a collective, five of us, let's buy a solar panel or something like that, that we can have one place in one area that can house us at a time 
your load shedding. So people are, and I think what, what we do, the injustice that we do is that when we sit in environments like this, we think that we have the solutions. The solutions are sitting there with the people that are affected by the, prob the very problems that we are trying to solve. So it becomes quite important to start saying, who's in what business here? And what is it that one can do in these businesses? So if we are all doing gotas, 10 of us are doing gotas, and we are affected by the same problem, 10 of us have to be active and part of the solution finding of the problems that we are facing. So for me, it, it is important that we are sitting in these spaces and we're engaging the very same people that we are trying to solve problems for because the solutions, most cases, lies with them, not with us. Bushale, what has been your impact and how have you sort of navigated this time? So for the food industry, I think it's been something that's been very detrimental um, from supply chain to health and safety. There's uh, a myriad of issues um, that load shedding brings along, you know. Um, but I think slowly we're starting to see a gap opening up with load shedding. Because um, literally how Bailey's is structured, we want it to be an everyday food solution. So from that, um, people are so used to the thing of cooking. It's, it's something that we're used to, you know. Um, people don't think outside of the, the realm of cooking. Um, but load shedding has forced you now to not cook and to be able to buy food, you know. Um, so for us, that's been a big up. Um, we, we, we are appreciative of it for that particular aspect. Um, yeah, but it, it's, been, it's been very challenging. Like I say, food, food safety, at the end of the day, there's some things that you feel like, uh-uh, we can't take chances of this because the, you know, the cold chain has been broken for the food. Um, and it's, it's easier for us to lose money than to have anyone sick or lose a, a customer, you know. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's been detrimental. But I think as Baileys, we're also trying to manage the alternative energy sources we have, trying to use gas um, and uh, trying to supplement with funny things. Like, I mean, there's always a plan, you know. Like for us, I know if you walk into a store, you mustn't tell anyone this, though. When you walk into a store at like past six, we'll have lights running, and those are being funneled from a car battery. Um, so we'll still be on, we'll still be a light, and then our kitchen would be using the, the, the generator and gas, you know. So I feel as, as township entrepreneurs, we're ingenuitive like that, you know. We always have a plan. So. A round of applause. You know, I think what I like. I think one of one of the things that we picked up in um, it was in one of the reports that we're working on. I'll just touch on this one thing, just this one thing. They give me permission, just this one thing. This, the, you know, this this guy says, you know, they lost about two thousand five hundred chickens, you know, due to due to load shedding. But because there was no help that was going to come from anywhere, he then says he decided that he was going to get canisters of paint, put them around the chicken feed, and light a fire, and monitor the heat of the fire to reticulate, and then move it manually. Because if I don't do that, I don't have chickens. If I don't have chickens, I can't have sales. If I can't have sales, I shut down. And I almost like it, you know, like it, you know, I like what Bailey is also talking about, because, and, and, and this then now leads me to you, Quentin, to say, you know, oftentimes when we think about finding solutions, you know, there's this big hoo-ha around solar, you know, but sometimes our minds just stick to solar and generators and we don't think about inverters. I don't even think about going to the local hardware, getting a couple of battery holders, getting a cable and then getting a battery and then I'm in business, then I charge it overnight the moment there's electricity. So I've got the look and feel of having electricity, but like Bailey's, I'm operating on gas. So I can still provide the service to my customers and generate whatever income that's required. So I've got this limitation that says, if I don't have this, then I can't do this. But sometimes maybe it's a lack of, we don't understand what some of the options that are available out there in the market are, whereas it's also that, uh, not even a perception, but, you know, sometimes you look at the cost of going off the grid or get, getting backup power, 30, 40, 
you, you ordinarily you then as a small business or as an you know as an individual you really feel like you're priced out of the market. Maybe just as a way of opening. Maybe if you can just talk around the solution that you that, you, that you're currently working on. That's keeping you very young looking and very happy every day, you know, delivering purpose, purpose driven products and solutions. And then if you can just engage, what, what sort of multitude of solutions can entrepreneurs sort of look at in bootstrapping and navigating this crazy time with the little budgets that they have? Yeah, thank you very much for that opportunity. Um, yeah, as a, I don't think, you know, you don't need to be an economist. Um, your analysts understand the impact that load shedding's had, right? It doesn't matter whether it's in your personal life, whether it's in your respective businesses. Um, there are a couple of numbers that I jotted down, and I actually would like to read them, really, to put context yeah. to the problem first, right? Um, so firstly, if you look at load shedding, a um, couple of realities we need to face. If anybody thinks it's going to get better anytime soon, right? So in 2021, South Africa shed, and I'm going to throw a couple of numbers at you, so just bear with me for a sec. Uh, but South Africa shed in 2021, 2,495 gigawatts per hour worth of electricity. That turned into 11,759 gigawatts. That's 4.7 times more than in 2021. Okay. Now let that sink in for a while until I give you the next number. In the month of January 2023, we shed more electricity in one month than we did for the combined 2021 from January till December. So again, that should be a good indication around, you know, if we think there is going to be a short-term solution to this, there definitely isn't, right? Um, I mean, compounded by that, obviously electricity prices have increased quite drastically, um, you know, going way above inflationary increases. So if you look again, 2021, uh, we were standing on 18% increase in electricity. 2022, last year, we were standing on 17%, again, way above inflation. And it's estimated that within 2023, we're looking at about a 25% increase in electricity prices. So again, you know, businesses and also the average consumer and the clients out there needs to start getting creative around electricity and electricity supply, right? We can't keep on doing the same thing and kind of expecting a different result, okay? So the, I've got a bit of a backstory that I'd actually like to share where this whole solution or this whole product actually stemmed from. So in 2020, I was actually looking at, at solar myself and um, looking at different ways in which I could fund it. So I've got a net bank home loan. Obviously, I work for net bank. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have enough equity in my bond to fund a solution like that. Now, the other alternative was I would have had to get a personal loan, right? And I think anybody that has had a personal loan before would know, you know, that's not an attractive value proposition for a solution that could sometimes cost two, three hundred thousand rand, correct? Um, so that's basically, I, I come out of the MFC space, uh, which is the vehicle financing arm of, of NetBank. Um, and I think we've had a massive success in as far as that business is concerned. But the more I started looking at the vehicle asset financing space and started looking at solar, the more I started realizing the commonalities between the two, up to the point that when I started looking at our processes, at our systems, how we could actually support a product as an asset-backed finance product, there was almost 95% similarity to a solar solution. Oh, okay, so, uh, to a solar solution to a normal vehicle asset finance um, product, effectively. And that's basically where this whole idea spawned from. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, and that's basically where this whole idea spawned from. So myself and my team have been extremely busy over the last couple of years um, building up the solution. One of the big things and very important things as well, and guys, yeah, I'm not punting NetBank in any way, shape or form, but I'm saying if you're going to go solar, if you're thinking about alternate solutions for energy, please make sure that you partner with somebody that is responsible, that has been in the market for quite some time, that is trusted and that deals with tier one reliable product. Um, you know, far too often in the last couple of weeks, um, you know, I think we, some of you might have seen the social media videos going around, around houses burning down with solar installations, sub-quality installations being done. Very important. That is one of the big things and one of the big drivers that we had to solve with this product to start off with is to partner with reliable suppliers that we know are going to be there for the long, long run, that's going to be there for the client, um, and, and that basically delivers top quality solutions to the consumer as well. Very importantly as well, I mean, most of you around here 
if you go and buy a car, you buy a 1.4 liter VW Polo, and you compare that to a 320 BMW, you understand what you're getting in those different types of products, right? You, the vehicle finance base is quite pervasive. Information about it is pervasive, and the knowledge base from the average consumer. Now, if I ask anybody here, uh, between a three-phase and a two-phase inverter and getting a five-kilowatt inverter with a 10-kilowatt battery with 14-kilowatt solar panels, I'm sure most of you are going to look at me blankly, right? Because that's the same look I had in my face when I started out my journey, my personal journey about two years ago. And that's why it's so important that we actually partner with suppliers that can actually hold the client's hand and do proper needs analysis, understand what the different need of the consumer is. Because again, you know, solar solutions, I almost want to say, are as varied as the people of South Africa, right? A 50,000 rand solution might work for me. A 500,000 rand solution might work for you. Again, it varies from person to person. And that's why it's so important that we actually get somebody that can actually hold the client's hand through this journey, understand the need. Um, you know, it is quite daunting, you know, if you think about solar in the bigger, bigger scheme of things. And uh, yeah, that's basically where this whole product was born from. Um, effectively, we went live um, August last year um, from a NetBank perspective. So it is now NetBank Solar powered by MFC. Um, at this stage, um, you know, we are predominantly focusing on the consumer segment, but hard at work to, to formulate a product for small and medium enterprise as well. Um, you know, so we, we are hard at work and hopefully very soon we can come with a good value proposition. In, I'm, I'm going to come back to you around price points, right? And around how does one even navigate getting the information? Because there's a plethora. I mean, there's an inverter, there is a solar panel, and there are batteries. Some batteries are lithium, some batteries are gel. Some batteries are lithium, but they're deep cycle. Some, some of them are 5.5 kVA. I, so I know a bit of electricity. But yeah. it's, it's a plethora of, of, of information. Maybe we'll then need to just dissect and unpack that. But police, I'm here. I'm a small business. I'm getting all this information. And it seems like a lot, which is why I can see it's just write it down. But how then do I then start to collate myself in pivoting? to the next business, you know, I think under the, under the threshold of thinking that says, you know, adapt or die, Ooh, you know, which is a reality in most cases because, you know, if, if, if you're not making sales in business, it's, a, it's not a business, it's a hobby because the lifeline of every business is sales. You need to be selling. If you're not in selling, if you're not selling, then you're going to pick up problems. You might not be able to make your repayments and whatsoever. So then, you know, the conversation around pivoting becomes super important because linking it directly to saying, how do I then navigate this time in making uh, money now? And I think just on the back of that, I think some of the things we've had to do is it's either you could sit, wait for power to come back, or you could get in the car and go deliver the documents that you could have emailed, you know? Because the guys, what we found is that with some of the guys, the guys are in the office. They're not leaving the office. So instead of waiting for them to check the emails, it's much quicker to say, you guys close at three. The power's only gonna be back at six, it left at two. We're actually gonna drive out and catch um, whoever needs to sign for whatever they need to sign for. When you get the physical copies, you'll later get the electronic copies. It might cost a little bit more, but you know, if you do nothing, the cost of doing nothing is far greater than the, the cost of, uh, of, of leaving it entirely to chance. So what are your thoughts on that? So for me, um, and you touched on it, Bulelani, when we started, Guti, a lot of us have a bad association with failure, number one. We have a bad association with closing down some of our businesses because we think, yo, but what's the ring? You understand? So I think for me, it is important that each of us as businesses have to look at the state and the health of our businesses currently. Where are they and what is happening? Do you see something changing in the next three to six months? Can you carry on with your business as it is for the next three months? If not, what are the alternatives? So it is a self-reflection thing, number one. You have to start with self and say, can I carry on? And also be married to creating value, not the product that you're selling. Be married to creating value. So you ask yourself, how do I continue creating value for the market that I am serving? If my current model of operations is not working, how do I go about 
uh, creating the value. Instead of sitting and just engaging on emails and trying to be, we, we had to do most virtual calls during COVID, right? Right now, we have an issue that says, get out of the building, as opposed to sit in the building. Now, can I do more of the getting out of the building and just meeting people outside? So the other day I had to work at McDonald's. The only thing I had to have was 50 rand to buy whatever they were selling, right? But I was like, I just need the power on. So I'll just spend 50 rand, buy french fries and a cold drink, then work and still get work done. You know, so for me it's self-reflection of what is the state of my business currently and can I carry on with my business in the next three to six months? If not, what are my alternatives? Number two, don't wait until the business is crippled to a point where you can't even sell it or position it as a value for somebody else. Because a lot of us, when we build businesses, particularly Tina, as Abantaba Myama, we build businesses for self, right? Most of our businesses are not sellable. And that's a big problem, is the business is you, the business is operating by you and all of those things, so you know everything. If you die tomorrow, the business is gone. You can't sell it. So if you have the desire to build a sellable business, you need to start thinking about what are the things that I need to put in place to do that, you know? So it's, it's important to then say, this asset, can I salvage something if my option is to just close it down? Because sometimes it is closing it down, right? Can I sell some of my assets to recoup some of the money so that I can set up the next venture and it is okay to start that? For the first three years of, of, of your journey as an entrepreneur particularly, you don't know what you don't know. A whole lot of us are testing stuff out, right? So for the first three years is a test phase. You don't get married to any product or service that you are selling. You get married to value, to delivering value, and it is important to, to always understand what the market is buying and, what the market, and how the market is responding to the offering that you are putting in to always change things around. Um, thank you so much. Um, Masali, just oh, give a round of applause. You know, I just want to ask, right, I mean, how have you kept the business competitive? Now, this then is a question that also feeds into load shedding. You sort of touched on it in terms of the, the batteries, you know, being able to efficiently provide the service. But, you know, someone might sit there and think, just as a side note, you know, got a business is not unique, I guess, up until they meet yours. But the gutter business is not unique. You know, why would I go into that space? Why should I even think about differentiation? And then in the midst of chaos, which is um, load shedding, why should I even think of pivoting my business and getting more consumers in different creative ways? So what has kept you competitive without really giving away your trade secrets? I think the biggest secret of them all, which I can share, is building a community. Um, especially with a business like ours, because um, food is an essential. And I mean, it, it all boils down essentially back to your problem solution statement, you know. Um, for us, the problem was that African food and that sort of food was not enjoyable um, for people outside of the township, you know. Um, so when they do walk in, they get that experience, and that sort of thing. So we've built a strong community around that, you know. People, when they walk in there, they get a feeling more than anything. Um, and for us, it's essentially about keeping the standard of the product where it needs to be and keeping the lights on, uh, whether that's figuratively or physically. Just as long as the business is running, we've built a strong enough community for people to be able to enter a business and uh, want to come back the next time, you know, before they even uh, interact with their actual food. Just the interactions prior to them... Um, getting the food, like talking to, you know, there's, I, I'm trying to get this point across, but it's difficult. Um, am I still audible? Yeah. All right. Um, but essentially, we, we have some customers who would walk in and um, talk and talk and talk with whether it's us or the staff um, about very deep things, you know. Um, and then at the end of it, they'll remember, oh, I was here for God, you know. So we've built a community like that. And I, and I think... You know, through every single challenge, if you've built a community around your business, you, you are able to ride the wave with them. You know, just, just on the back of that, right, um, 
you know, for many, many years, I ran an internet cafe. Now, you know, if, if, you, if you don't understand the business you're running, that the cost of doing business becomes extremely high. Then every problem that comes becomes a problem that almost seems like it's damnation. It's the end of your business. You don't think solutions. You know, you don't think, let me learn about this thing. Let me think solution. Because, you know, you know when I think of the, primarily the, 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 the cotta business, I mean, I think well, what we used to do then, we had people coming all this far as Rustenburg to come and type CVs in Tembisa. And that's the and, and this differentiation, right, in the market. But one of the things that I really want entrepreneurs to really delve into, especially also in this time with the advent of all this chaos that we're picking up, is rethink your customer. Same product, but rethink the customer. You know, because the same quarter that I sell Kokasi and I've built a community, and they're buying it, and there's load shading, and I'm benefiting from load shading because they don't cook and they buy, is the same one I could sell to people in urban areas that are the same black people that lived in the township communities, but they're buying it not because they can't afford Woolies food of the sort. They're buying it purely out of nostalgia and because it's go high. And that cell is totally different from the cell that I sell to someone who lives in the same neighborhood as me. And that's a totally different cell to the cell when I specifically plot out markets and exhibitions that primarily have people of a different race who want to sell it purely because they want a totally new experience and they want an African experience. So same product, but what you've then now done is that you've been able to, number one, export the product to other places. Number two, you've then been able to, through segmentation, build multiple revenue streams. So sometimes when I engage with entrepreneurs, and I'm digressing a bit, but I'll come back, is when you think about solutions, don't think too far. But sometimes when you think too far, you end up becoming too expensive to implement those new solutions and ideas because you think beyond what you already have, as opposed to this is what I have. Who else would be interested in what I have? You know, But Quentin, a lot of us don't understand the markets that we are serving, right? We want to be, to, we want to appeal to everyone. We want to be the business that serves everyone. There's no business that serves everyone. You have to choose your market. And when you understand your market, um, you start creating the language that speaks to that market. So for instance, IT understands the market. That's why they can use Bekele Bek as a, as a tagline, right? As a hashtag because they understand who they are talking to. It's the township market. But they will probably change it up if they buy a Bulani markets, because these guys, they want suits and ties and all of those things. They want formality. So it is important that you're not just doing business to make money. Do business because you want to create value. And once you want to, want to create value, start saying, but who am I creating value for? What do, what do they look like? Are they women, men? children and all of those things, and what are they interested in? What does value look like for them? And you start packaging your solution to fit that part particular value, and that's what's help you, because then you're not everyone else. We could be selling a matamati C5, but I could package my tamatis and make them branded, plastic packaging, attract a different market. Laba by five, so you have to choose your lane as a business, and then just say, is this just to put food on the table, or is this a business? And if it is a business, it has to have a brand. It has to have a specific market that you are serving in a particular problem that you are trying to solve. So now, Quentin, I think just back, I mean, even before we sort of delve into the price points, right? Um, I mean, for small businesses primarily, because this is the audience that's here at large, what are some of the solutions that they could put in, potentially consider you know, um, for the business? And what are some of the pro solutions that you guys have sort of worked on for them? And then so sort of latching on to what are some of the price points? And I mean, if I'm a small business and I'm here, what would almost be required of me to participate you know, in these solutions? I kind of like the direction this conversation is going. Um, because a lot of it, and it's been mentioned now a couple of times, you know, is what is the cost of doing nothing, right? Um, a lot of times we see in, in the fact that, you know, it might be a big upfront cost, depending on obviously what scale um, you would want to go, um, you know, as a small business, as a consumer as well. 
Um, but what, what, what is that pivotal point where that, that cost of doing nothing about it is actually you know, almost turning into a bit of a make or break scenario for yourself? Um, I've been in a lot of conversation with businesses, with colleagues, and even friends, right? And almost I would say the de facto position I always get is to go off the grid is too expensive. And that's almost where my immediate retort to that is you, you started from a wrong starting point. You wanted to go off the grid. Um, my suggestion and, and my, my almost want to say impassionate plea to anybody is have a look at what is the minimum viable product that will work for you. Plan big, but start small. Okay. Work within your budget. Do not overextend yourself and make sure that you work with a solution that is scalable, that will work for you, but something that you can grow with and that can grow with your needs over time, right? So, you know, typical example, a small business, and I, and I had a um, conversation a little bit earlier today. Um, start with a small, like a five kilowatt inverter, five kilowatt batteries, five kilowatt solar solution. You know, if you look at something like that, typically, um, you know, whether, again, whether it's in, in your capacity as a consumer yourself or running your own business, Typically, a solution like that, an installment on a solution like that could be offset by the electricity saving that you're having, right? So, so you can then gradually almost grow into the solution and something that's a natural fit. And until you get to that point that you always say, now I'm at a point of saturation, I'm now happy with the solution that I've got that will work for me. So, so definitely, that is one of the things that I do want to stress. You know, when you look at solar as a solution, do not go big bang. Do not think big bang. Plan big bang, um, but start small. Obviously, there's other alternatives as well. Solar isn't always the only, you know, it's not the silver bullet, right? It's not the be-all and end-all. Um, and especially, you know, your really small startups can't afford a solution like that. There's always alternatives like your batteries, like your inverters. As you quite rightly said, that is a cheap option. Um, again, I just want to stress, you know, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, please do your homework. You know, make sure that you buy something that is going to be reliable, that is going to last you in your business. Um, you know, the Afrikaans have got a very good saying, goed koop koop is dier koop. So, so translating that, it basically just says, paying cheaply up front is going to cost you in the long run. And uh, so, so make sure that you buy a good quality product that is actually going to last you and your business. Um, again, there's numerous options for that as well. And I'm going to do a bit of a shameless punt here as well uh, for our Avo platform. Um, you know, I, I would definitely not be punting a product that I don't firmly believe in. I'm actually an avid user of the Evo platform, if there's anybody around. You know, fantastic specials, you know, great services, great products being um, offered on the Evo platform. And, you know, these types of solutions, these smaller scale type of solutions are all readily available there. You're talking about, you know, your small, I want to say five, ten thousand rand solution that can kind of carry you through those load shedding periods. Again, guys, as I said, do not try and start big if you, basically if you can't handle, um, you know, or kind of afford a solution uh, to that extent. So, so again, very importantly, you know, most of these products are available on the Avo platform. For those that haven't checked it out, I would really um, urge you to do so on, on the Android apps, uh, on the App Store, um, on Apple Play, oh, no, not Apple Play, sorry, what's the Apple Store again? Sorry, yeah, it's the Apple Store. Um, or just by visiting avo.africa um, and, and just go and browse around and have a look what they've got to offer. But again, you know, there's, there's many ways to skin this proverbial cap. There isn't, or cat, there isn't a, a one-size-fits-all. And then before I ask them the last question and then I'll open up to a few, I think just in thinking about solutions, right? You know, it's, it becomes very important because I think also there's also like a missing gap in the market where even if you go into a solar store, which I've done, some of the guys don't know. They're selling their products, but they don't know, which is why it super becomes important when you're engaging someone, you know, when you're engaging a Quentin who's got full on knowledge, but also then you then go back and you do your own research, right? you then be able to understand that I can't afford solar at all. It won't, just won't work for my business. Right? I'm in the industrial space. I can't, if I, if, I, if I totally get solar that's gonna power up my business, I'm gonna need to spend 500,000, you know, as opposed to getting a high industrial you know, generator that I could utilize to then offer me backup power. 
And then if I'm sitting, say, Kasi, and I'm running an accounting business or an internet cafe, could I not potentially get, you know, an inverter, you know, with a backup battery? And what then you do then in that particular case, you get about the 5 kVA or the 3 kVA with gel batteries that are cheaper, but they last, what, two to three years, you know? And you know that you sort of recoup that back through your sales. But then someone then sits and says, how? But the space that I'm operating from is not a space that I own, so I can't be drilling battery packs onto the wall. Then I could go to my local hardware and then start engaging those guys to say, these in backup inverter boxes that I can plug onto the wall, that can give me immediate power for low voltage appliances, what are they? Then I think that's the sort of progressive way in terms of saying, um, you will then start to look at solutions. So some of the things that I'm even sharing with you now are things where I took the whole entire past three weeks and I went to different places to then unpack what, does the, what is this thing? You know when you ask a question like a dumb person, what is a solar panel? I see some are saying 480 watts, some are saying 5 kilowatts. So I see a system and a grid, and the grid has two batteries, there's an inverter, and there's 12 panels. What does this all even mean? Can I have 40 panels on one grid? Can this potentially even work for my business? You know, And I think those things then become progressive as you are running on a day-to-day -day base, because I understand the entrepreneurial cycle, right? It's purely, mostly, it's purely survivalist, meaning you might not even have the time to be hopping from one space to another, but you need to allocate that time, even if it's an hour a week, to researching how then do you then start to navigate the solutions so that you get yourself out of um, this time and start to plan that even if I come across a 5,000 or a 10,000, I'd at least have a battery box, a solar box, that I can plug into the wall. And if I've got that solar box, it might be generating more power than I require, then it makes me smarter then I could rally up all the other guys who are in the services space who only need to utilize electricity in that time and charge them 500 rand a month for utilizing my backup power when I'm up and they are down. It's just thinking out of the box and being able to utilize the problems that everyone else is complaining about and saying, could I bootstrap through other people's problems, which is a shared problem, and create this community of individuals and drive solutions. So to you, Lisa, and I'll bring it up. Um, last question, then they'll throw in one for Quentin and I'll ask on the floor because we've kept you guys here and then there'll be lunch. But what are some of the solutions that one could think of right, in this time? Even it might not necessarily be technical solutions that you might bring to the fore, but in not just closing themselves off, but to really open one's mind to saying, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna do stuff. Because I mean, the way in Kulanga Kona, it was, it, you know, it was, it was to say, next door, I need moto, ekayas, I moto, I need bread. I'll get money to buy bread, right? So sometimes people have the things, they have the problem of not maintaining them, which is why I think Butlali sort of shared our conversation, right? You know, when I was like to him, you know, it doesn't matter, even if the worst had to happen, you know, I don't have the ego that says I can't hustle a 1400 and start doing odd jobs. I'm not kidding. I mean, because it's the moment you start to put ego into entrepreneurship. Because, you know, what I always say to the guys I work with is money's in the streets. That's why, even as an internet cafe, it's him, Lisa. We knew very well that if I wait for people to come, they're not going to come. I must go and fetch them because they've got a problem. I get I must go to their houses and tell them, no, which I say late, so I'll come and I'll get the, the written document so that I go back to the internet cafe and type it, and then I'll come back at night when you're home, when you're eating dinner, and deliver it for you so that you've got your updated CV. Are you happy with that? So I think, and we've spoken about it quite a lot. For me, the first thing is community, right? Is in business, you have to understand that you have to have a community around you. You can't do it you want, you understand? And sometimes what that requires is that we can take the models that we are normally used to. For instance, can we set up a stock fell, Samasola? Can we set up a stock fell? So with massive Panama thousand rand, Sambe Sotenga, Stengelo Lo, Isola panel, Stengelo Lo, Isola panel, the next time. It's a model that we understand. It's a model that we've used to service and to fund various things. We've started a property stock fell. And it's, now we can start a solar stock fell. That's one solution you can th start thinking about. <coughs> so the other no, you can give the round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> so 
so you, you start doing that. But also it's saying, can we come together? So when we understand who's, who's in what business in our communities, number one doesn't work in these communities. We are all facing the same problem. Can we have a get together as Abantabatengisamakota because we are all affected by the same problem and say, guys, let's come up with a solution. Sometimes it, it just requires a strategic three hour session together to co create and say, we are all facing the same problem. What does a solution for our business look like? I'm a taxi driver, know that quite well. That's why you have Uato, Amsta, and all these guys. They are all in the taxi business, but they understand that for us to thrive in this type of business, we have to come together. Do we need to come together in the ver various dis uh, businesses that we are in? We do. You can sometimes you don't have the money to solve the problem alone. Sometimes it makes sense to come together collectively and put together resources together, then go out and get that solution. You will all win at the end of the day. So for me, it's, it's, it's the traditional things that we have let go that will actually work for us now. And some of the principles that we have learned, particularly as African people, those are the things that we need to dial up more on right now. It's not going to be your world. It needs to be our world. We all have to come together to find the solution because it's not going away. And I think Quentin mentioned that load shedding, this, they projected good, the next two years is just going to be crazy. So if we are not thinking about coming together right now and building a community to solve problems that we are all facing, we are in it for a long run. So I think for me, the the major learnings that I've taken from load shedding, um, or the other thing we can take moving forward, I think, is the thing of taking accountability. You know, um, understanding that it's there, it's something that we're going to have to live with, and it doesn't it doesn't help. You know, to sit back and say, "Hey, I can't do this because the lights are off and whatnot." You know, um, so I think the best advice I could give, especially for people in my industry, is you know, take account. Take uh, take stock of all the things that you have, you know, which are your best sellers, which are the ones that move the fastest, so that you are able to mitigate risk where you can, you know. For, for instance, if you're selling ice cream, don't sell seven different flavors of ice cream. Maybe choose the top three that sell, that you know are going to sell by the end of the day, you know. Um, even with food, the same, the same principle applies. Uh, so uh, take stock on that, on that particular aspect. Decrease the, the product offering you have, you know so that it's more impactful and it, it hits where it needs to hit, you know, um, while still maintaining your brand. Because at the end of the day, you can't have your brand changed because it was load shedding, you know. I can't now start wanting to do sandwiches because they're more efficient. Because Bailey's, you know it because it's about said he got. Um, so it's just about finding uh, innovative ways around that, you know. Um, and I think secondly, like Kusli Tolisa has said, we really need to look at <coughs> ways of coming together and, 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 you know, assisting each other through the challenges. Because um, we, we definitely not going to make it as individuals. Um, whether it's starting ghost kitchens, whether it's having shared facilities to prepare food, all those sort of things, you know. A lot of communities have been doing that forever. I don't know why as black people we're so far behind. And um, we're really proud of into the, the, the thing you're Ubuntu. You know, but I don't think we implement it in the manner that we should. Um, so yeah, definitely those two things. Just you know, being able to know how your business makes its money, because that's where you'll know which products work for you best, and you'll you'll double down on those. You know, um, those will keep people coming in, whether the lights are on or off, and obviously coming together. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think one of the big things we need to realize, you know, whether it's as community or whether it's as small business, is that everybody feels the pain of load shedding equally, right? Um, and I think a very interesting use case, and I actually jotted it down um, to share it, that I became aware of, um, is actually Vietnam. So in Vietnam, they were uh, sitting with a constrained electricity supply as well, very much the same as South Africa is at this point in time. Um, there was government incentive at that point in time to feed back into the electricity grid. And I know that government has started coming to the party, right, and as far as those negotiations are concerned. But just a, a bit of statistics here, I want to throw your direction again on why I firmly believe this problem is solvable. 
So in 2019, um, rooftop solar in Vietnam generated 378 meg megawatts per hour. Okay, so that's 0 0.3 gigawatts per hour on average. Okay, within one year they've bumped that up to 9.2 gigawatts. Now that's effectively, if I can make it real in the South African context, that's expunged stage nine load shedding because nine gigawatts is stage nine. Okay, so within the space of a year, the Vietnamese people, and this is not big business, um, you know, this is your average everyday consumer by implementing rooftop solar and almost building a little hybrid and, a, and an ecosystem and a community of solar suppliers were able to almost become self-sufficient. Um, so that's definitely, I think, the direction we need to work. We need to work with each other, and again, like I said, whether it's within our communities or within our businesses, because there's now evidential use case that this is actually, you know, that this has worked before. Now, now just tell me, you're saying that they're generating, what, nine gigawatts? Nine gigawatts. And, and that expunges, hour. what, stage nine? Stage nine. That's, that's the equivalent of stage nine. So the equivalent of stage six would be what? Say six again. gigawatts? Six gigawatts, yes. I learned something new. I thought there were just stages. That's what it actually means. That's what it actually means, yeah. So, so the stage is actually equated to the gigawatts per hour that needs to be shed off the grid. <laughs> I'm thinking money now. Yeah, but yo, I learned something new. But before I ask you for final words, I just want to check from the audience, is there anyone who's got any question? I might not have asked anything. Maybe you might have your own question or thoughts. This is your chance. We'll open up to... Uh, four individuals. Okay, we've got the gentleman at the back. Um, anyone else? Maybe if I can just get the four hands first, and then maybe we'll have them come. Oh. Uh, lady Nyana. Okay, there, we've got the lady in pink. The lady in pink at the back. The lady in pink at the back. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I think this is just us collectively having a conversation to find solutions. You know, no one individual has, but this is our effort, and I think... Um, in starting, we've learned, I've learned a few things, and I think through conversations, because what we've also done um, through NetBank is what NetBank has done through us and we've done together is we've commissioned research. And I think it's, it's such an interesting thing because as part of that, you know, I think as we chat, you know, I think we should and we will unpack all the different solutions that are there that are available as far as something as minutely thought of as the battery, right? As because some of the guys, you know, in some of them talk about using khas, but the khas are so those are some of the things, and we're not saying that it's an absolute, but we're saying consider and find yourself in any of this. Um, I teach project management and I'm in uh, real estate. But now, uh, this is actually just an ask, a uh, follow on, on ET today. So thank you to NetBank and T to organizing the event. Um, you mentioned something, you learned the stage six stuff. Now, here I am, I'm running my course online for four hours. I literally have no clue what my uh, energy needs are. I could go around and ask people, but as a follow-on, maybe an ask to you guys, to formally probably do um, uh, YouTube shorts or, or I don't know, uh, YouTube videos of some sort, to actually educate um, and have a credible source. Because right now, I go on, on, on YouTube or Facebook or whatever, there is a million uh, people who are trying to explain uh, what, what, what are my needs. But I'm just thinking a credible source with credible support and then link that to a particular product. Okay, so when you're talking about three, three kilowatts, that's what I need. Okay, how do I need that? How do we get to that? And I know if I'm getting it from T and I'm getting it from NetBank website or from Evo website, it's actually something 
valuable that I can then use. And it, it just shortens my, my journey. And um, it, it quickens the pace between me uh, uh, and me procuring a product or getting a product from ever. It, it, it's a smaller capital cost from your end, guys, I, th I believe. So, Gabo. No, uh, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank uh, T, to thank T for this uh, informative uh, session and NetBank. But I think mine is more of a question to NetBank to say that have you guys considered maybe creating a credit facility for you know companies, small businesses in particular, those who are in the township you know, creating a credit facility that's going to look at uh, assisting with the load shading crisis that they have. Because one of the dynamics that we have is that, you know, it's, it's much easier to have solutions that we can all contribute to when we are operating in one place. But if we are scattered, you know, it's very difficult for us to put together money and say, let's buy this solution it will work for all of us. Um, so if obviously NetBank does have, I think, the, 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 the muscle to check how many watts your businesses use, uh, what are your business needs in terms of you know, load shading, but can NetBank look at creating that credit facility you know, for township-based businesses where we could you know, access that credit facility, and over time, of course, you could pay that 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 generator or that inventor, depending on what you use, or even batteries. Thanks. Hi, guys. Oh. Okay. Um, my name is Tadelo Mata. I'm coming from a company called UPD002. So we are a power solution company as well. So we do solar installation. We also you know, offer your backup system as well. Um, so actually, the guy just asked me the question, asked the question that I wanted to ask. Um, that as a net bank is a bank, you know, and then they work with small businesses and right now, this is the challenge that small businesses are facing, which is they are not able to operate because they, they don't have um, electricity. So uh, what I, I wanted to ask you know, is that, um, do you guys um, assist, you know, or do you have maybe, uh, do you finance small businesses if they come to you and then look into maybe uh, buy these, um, electrical, electricity solutions. That's the first question. And the second thing is that, you know, so what we did with my company, we actually partnered with a company called Linear Investment. So what they do is that um, they look at the qualifying businesses, uh, commercial businesses, or I mean corporate, sorry, or individuals. So, and then they actually, um, uh, first, you know, check if they can qualify for certain packages. If they qualify, then they buy those um, electricity uh, solution for them. Actually, sort of nervous, guys, uh, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, what they do, uh, what um, a linear investment does, is that you know they look at um, qualifying people and then they buy these. Um, power solution for them. And then, so uh, what, we, what is our job there is to um, install for people also, you know. Um, so uh, as, as a net bank, because um, obviously how I started this chain actually, um, as like uh, <laughs> you men, um, I, I, I used to have an internet cafe, so we, we had a problem of load shading, and then we looked at all the solutions. Firstly, we went for a generator, which was burning a lot of, you know, a petrol. And um, the, one of the guys came to me and said, man, you know, why using a generator while you can actually have a system that, you know, is gonna save you money 
and then it's not it's not noisy as a, a generator, you know. So that's why we went to uh, we bought Invector, and the Invector that we bought um, it actually uses electricity. So when there's a load shedding, then the Invector just uh, picks up fast, and then you know we are able to operate. So it's like it's hybrid actually. So it means it charges when there's electricity and when there's no electricity, you know, so it works. Yeah, I think I was clear enough. <laughs> All right. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lesita Tona. Uh, I'm a property entrepreneur. Um, uh, I think uh, the, the fact of the matter and the reality is that um, we, no one is going to rescue us. Um, it's up to us. And uh, as soon, the sooner we deal with that reality and stop pointing fingers, the better. Um, so, so we are on our own to, to a greater extent. Um, so, so my it's, it's it's more of a question um, to 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 the panel and I think to the rest of us to a greater degree, is that isn't this an opportunity that perhaps we could use to have a an Uber of electricity of some sort, uh, you know, to then say if I don't have a car now, it does not mean that I don't have access to um, um, to a mode of transport. Um, so, so my my it's not really a question per se. I think it's more of a challenge as well to to the entrepreneurs to really say perhaps it's time that we also as part of thinking of the solution, but also to then say isn't there an Uber of some sort for 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 electricity? Um, you know, electricity generation because you know you, some people don't need electricity for two hours. Um, you know, different times, and others would need it for whatever t you know period of time that they would need it. Uh, but I think it's more of a challenge. But perhaps to your question, if uh, the solution is not there, to then say let's also think of um, for those that, especially that they cannot afford um, to support the businesses in particular, because they are the backbone of um, um, you know, rejuvenating the economy. To start thinking of, um, I'd call it to, to like a better way, to, uh, an Uber of some sort for for, for electricity. Thanks. Hi again, Sanbonan. My name is Prudence. I'm still young, black, and gifted. Um, so <laughs> yeah. So um, oh, it's very difficult not to speak when you're a talker, but mine is more of a suggestion. I just want to put it in the suggestion box. But I just want to put a disclaimer to my suggestion. Like, asna mali. You know, I'm not sure if you understand. Like, asna mali, as entrepreneurs. And it's very difficult to facilitate any asna mali, you know? And you see, it's frustrating. Asna mali. And the biggest thing, and when you hear a uh, bank, net bank, capital bank, you think, oh, money. You know, it's here now. And, um, well, my suggestion is that uh, I'm the one to point fingers. I'm black like that. Uh, is that, um, for example, like I really wish that if NetBank were to come, this is a power bank, at least, you know, so that we are able, since we are finding solutions to load shading, or Ganjan, please the power bank, you know, because you have the money to do it, you know. But other than that, mine um, as a suggestion is that, like you said, Uguti, at some point we need to recognize that we're all alone. And I think that uh, the stock fell uh, industry or the stock fell market really works, and people don't realize how powerful it is, especially. So I was just suggesting, you know, even if the bank doesn't help us, if there's any entrepreneur who's not scared of people's money, to open a stock fair, you know, where we can contribute a certain amount of money and we can actually maybe, for example, help this business buy a generator this month, that business buy a what what this month. If ansabi, mean ansabu contributor, ansabu bambi miles abantu. You know, but I think if we can put it as a, I don't know if any entrepreneur here is into this money uh, systems, whereby we are able to open a stock fell where we actually contribute money to assist businesses because we have low trading is last for two years. And I mean, we can't have the same problems and the same conversations two years from now. So if we can at least have a stock fell where we can contribute money to actually assist businesses I'm a lights, I'm a generator, because I see no money. I can't afford all the system alone. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, do you want to take a stab at the first yeah. two? Hundred percent. Okay, I think maybe just the first one. The gentleman, the first gentleman who came up. Um, I think in this collective research that we're doing, I definitely know we'll do something to what you're talking about. They are smiling. I know. Done. Yeah. Then maybe you can take a stab at the two, and then maybe we'll talk. To <laughs> I'm locking them in, and then maybe we could talk to. Maybe we can try to talk about. I think what was suggested by Lisecha, you know, around. Is, is there an innovative solution? I mean, I don't have the plan, but I think that collectively, you know, if like what the lady said, if we work together, maybe. 100%. So th I think to start off with, um, you know, the MFC uh, website, as well as the NetBank website, I think is already doing quite a lot to try and educate your everyday consumer around what solar is, what solar isn't, right, and what different forms of renewable energy there is. Because, I mean, you know, again, solar, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, isn't the silver bullet. I take the suggestion as well, and we've already started having a look at it as well, as putting certain, almost want to say turnkey solutions, out-of-the-box solutions on the site that you can kind of illustrate to say, you know, typically five solutions and says these five solutions, this is roughly what it's going to cost you and this is roughly what you're going to get out of that solution. So it is something that we are actively looking at on our websites to actually educate the consumer. But I think the, the very important thing, um, you know, and again, just coming back to the suppliers that we're on board, that's where that missing link is. And that's we, we've identified this right at the beginning of this product, is that we're financial experts, right? We're not energy experts. And that's why it's so important that we partner with the right people that can actually guide our clients, help our clients through this process. Because it is daunting, you know. It, it, I went through this myself. So anybody, I'm sure there might be one or two or a handful of people that have actually gone through a solar journey here. Um, to go through this journey is daunting. You know, you kind of feel lost. You feel clueless. You don't know where to begin. And that's where it's so important that the supplier actually holds your hand through this process. You know, actually walks. And this is literally, guys, what, what happens. The supplier comes out. They do an upfront needs analysis with you. They actually then book a site visit. And they come and spend time on your premises, whether it's your business or whether it's your house. They spend half an hour, hour. They actually walk from plug to plug with you, try and understand what is your need. What do you really need to power? You know, are you looking for a hybrid solution, uh, off, off the grid solution, or are you basically just looking to get through the hump of load shedding? Um, you know, and they go through, they go through all of that with you, and then they come up with different solutions as well. Because again, you know, just putting solar in isn't the silver bullet. You know, I, I, for instance, when I had my needs analysis done, the engineer actually walked through the house and said, hey, listen, bud, if you replace all, because all my lights were normal 100-watt globes, right? So he said, if you replace all your globes in your house, and there was about 20 of them, this is going to cost you, give or take, about, call it a 1,000 rand, right? He says, if you, if you spend this 1,000 Rand, I'm going to quote you most probably on a solution that's going to cost you about 50,000 Rand less. So these small things, and you know, I've, I've said this quite often after I've basically gone solo myself as well about a year and a half ago. Um, going solo or going with alternative energy, you're not buying a product, you're buying a lifestyle. Um, it, is, it is a mindset change that you're adapting. You, you're not buying something out of the box. So very importantly. Um, the gentleman that mentioned a little bit earlier around being in solar as well, guys, I need, I can't stress this enough. Myself and Lizzie were chatting about this a little bit earlier. At this point in time, there is a massive demand for installers specifically and as far as solar is concerned in the country. Um, our partners at home are actively, they've actually started up a, a skills program um, in conjunction with YES as well, in which they are really trying to actively push to get installation companies, get them accredited, get them trained up, because we're sitting with a massive bottleneck in that regard. Um, so again, if there's anybody that is in the solar industry and that does actually do solar installations, please feel free after the time to come have a chat with me. I'll make sure to get, uh, get um, you in contact with uh, the guys over at Home Energy, um, and I'll make sure to that, that you guys link up. All right, there is a massive demand at this point in time. All right. Sorry, does that answer all the questions? Uh, the credit. And as far as the credit is concerned, so the, again, just, you know, we, we kind of took baby steps approach with this product. Um, the product that we've now recently launched is mainly aimed at the consumer market. 
um, and fully cognizant as well that obviously your, your small business does not operate in a similar fashion as the consumer segment does. So we are actively working on putting a product or products together, actually not a product, but putting products together uh, for small business as well. That is in the pipeline, so I just want to say just watch this space. Um, I'm definitely not educated enough um, and know too little about the stock fell, but th in that regard, so I'm not going to elaborate too much in as far as the stock fell is concerned, but also I want to say in that regard, watch that space. <laughs> 100%. Okay, 100%. So, guys, if anybody here is interest, interested in solar, what you can do, and this is a, a little bit of an anti-pattern to what I think everybody would be traditionally accustomed to in the banking sector, right? Because we try and push product. Here we don't try and push product. We try and push your way to one of our providers first. Okay. Like I said, we, the energy experts, or oh, the, the financial experts, not the energy experts. So one of the important things, either if you visit mfc.co.za or netbank.co.za, it'll take you step by step through the process that you need to follow. The first step is visit one of our approved suppliers. Okay, very important step in the process. Um, there's hyperlinks to those suppliers as well. Um, you know, if I look, for instance, at one of our, or one of our, our suppliers like Home Energy, They've got a very user-friendly website in which you can register and do an upfront needs analysis. It takes you all of about five minutes. And you can kind of get a sense of what you'll be in for for a solar solution. You know, if, if that tickles your fancy, obviously you can then book a site visit. No obligation. You know, it doesn't cost you anything. Get an engineer out and let them come and do a proper quote for you. You know, and that, that takes you that one level more accurate on what your need is. Um, and as soon as that is done and dusted, you can get back into the mfc.co.za or netbank.co.za website and you can apply online for your solar solution. You can literally get an answer back within a couple of minutes on, on your application. Sorry, does it answer the question, guys? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I think in wrapping up, we'll do the pitching and then food. Please don't leave without eating. We've got food. Yeah, you're, they are dying as well. Eh? So maybe closing words. 30 seconds, closing words, closing words. We hand over to Spoo to announce uh, the pitch winners um, in order, and then we eat. Network. Yeah, no, I won't be long. Um, I think the, the only thing that I'd like to land with everybody um, is something that I've actually hold, held dear to my heart since I was a young boy, and that is when you think about solar, when you think about alternate energy supply, Plan twice, execute once, instead of trying to do that the inverse, okay? Do your homework. Um, you know, like I said, whether you're going to go through the NetBank channels or not, whether you're going to use one of the NetBank approved suppliers or not, do your homework. Make sure that the supplier is reliable. Make sure that the goods that you're procuring is reliable and it's actually going to carry in the future and it's actually going to meet the demand of your business. All right. Thank you. But yeah, for me, I don't know, I might get in trouble for saying this, but um, whenever I hear bank and credit, um, for me immediately I know that for people like you and I, that's probably not going to be the greatest of journeys. Um, so truth be told, I think for us as, as township entrepreneurs, we should look for solutions within ourselves, you know. Um, understand your business. No one actually knows your business better than you know your business. So start finding those solutions slowly. And, and for me, what I know has worked is being as lean as possible, you know. We've scaled down as far as we can in terms of our product offering so that we're able to balance that. Um, so just be creative of how you go about it because I think this is a problem that's going to be with us for a long, long time. And the solutions that are going to be accessible and relatable for you and I may not come anytime soon. So start looking with it. I think for me, there's two things, right? There's two opportunities. The first opportunity is that there are businesses that are in the energy space right now or in the electricity space, installers. Find out what NetBank is doing, number one, to become, they were talking about credible suppliers or approved suppliers. If you are in that space, how do you become an approved supplier to NetBank? And is there an ESD program? Because but. For us, mostly black businesses, we're probably not going to qualify to be an approved supplier because of all the terms and conditions that are there. 
but there could be an ESD program. Sbu said, I'm an ESD specialist. An ESD is there to serve us as black businesses. So if there's an ESD program that can be created to support black businesses to become credible service providers or approved service providers in your platform. And I think it's an opportunity for you guys to look at that, where we are saying, let's take 10 businesses from Alex, from Katlehong, and in partnering with T, because you already have the database with these guys, where we are saying, let's put them together in a six-month, eight-month, 12-month program where they can be credible and can be listed because now you're solving a demand issue. You have black businesses that are providing solutions to some of our black businesses in the community. That's the first one. The second thing is that as a business, where there are problems, there's always solutions. You can't be crippled by the problems that exist. You always, always have to think about what are the ways that I can find solutions to this problem? And sometimes the solutions does come up through conversations. Don't be afraid to go out and engage with other people. These platforms are important. Engage in these platforms and find friends that are, fi that are facing the same problems that you're facing. And then together, club together and solve the problem. That, ladies and gentlemen, is our panel for today. That wraps up the formal, well, almost wraps up the formal proceeding. So we will now just do the pitch winners. But before our panelists leave the stage, if I could just have you stand, uh, climb up together. The photographer is going to take a picture. You, you, you can smile. We got it. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Let's give them a round of applause.